ויאמר אלוהים, נעשה אדם בצלמנו כדמותנו, וירדו בדגת הים, ובעוף השמיים, ובבהמה וכל הארץ, ובכל הרמס הרומס על הארץ. ויברא אלוהים את האדם בצלמו, בצלם אלוהים ברא אותו, זכר ונקבה ברא אותם. ויברך אותם אלוהים, ויאמר להם אלוהים, פרו ורבו ומילאו את הארץ, וכבשוה. ורדו בדגת הים ובעוף השמיים, ובכל חיה הרומסת על הארץ. ספר בראשית, פרק א', פסוקים 26 עד 28. Then Elohim said, Let us make humankind in our image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the animals, and over all the earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living creature that crawls on the earth. The Book of Genesis, Chapter 1 Verses 26 through 28. Shalom Alechem Uvruchim Hashavim. Peace be upon you and welcome back to a most biblically enlightening episode 15 of Finding Finding Higher higher ground. Ground. Transmitting on all frequencies and bandwidths from a secret location deep in the heart of Seattle, Washington, USA. It is yours truly, the American-born, Israeli-raised, self-proclaimed, manic messianic, and your host of this podcast, Gadi Hire. Great big thank yous go out to all the people at Anchor, Spotify, Epidemic Sound, and Audacity. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the hard work you put in to keep my podcast going. A very special thank you goes out to oneforisrael.org one of the leading ministries in Israel that brings the good news of salvation of Messiah Yeshua to all inhabitants of the state of Israel, be it Jew or Arab. May Abba Father bless the fruit of your labor in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Surprise! Yes, it's me, the Manic Messianic. I have returned a lot quicker this time. Let's just say, due to current developments, I've had some time freed up. I happen to have a quiet house all to myself, which doesn't happen often. But I am very grateful for the place that I live in, so this is not a complaint. So I thought to myself, perhaps I could spend some time playing video games and blowing demons up on Doom Eternal or record another podcast. So here we are. I cannot help it. I am Jewish. And uh, 
us Jewish folk have a lot to say. Apparently. We're all reading from a book that was written by Jews for Jews. So we have a lot to say. So I keep on talking about getting back into this amazing book called Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus. I have not forgotten this mission of mine to analyze this book with you, dear listener. And the name of the next chapter will be called Chapter 4, The Creation Mandate. But before I get into the book, a few words to follow up on episode 14. Ruach HaKodesh, he, she, or it. Well, one thing we can be clear of is that Ruach HaKodesh is definitely not an it. And I say that surely based upon the fact that the word in Hebrew for spirit, Ruach, is feminine. Nor do I agree with the statement that Ruach HaKodesh is not a person. I'm not entirely sure about that. I would have to think that over. I guess you could say that the only person out of the three would be Messiah Yeshua himself because he was in the flesh. He also says that Abba is spirit. In John 4.24 it is written, Elohim is spirit, and worshippers must worship him spiritually and truly. So, yeah, I guess it would be correct to say that perhaps Ruach HaKodesh is not a person in that regard. Though sometimes I feel like it diminishes from Adonai Elohim, because to me, I feel like he's the person of persons. But that's just how I see it. What do I know? I am not an expert. I do hope you enjoyed episode 14, I hope it gave you a lot of food for thought, and I'd like to follow that through. Uh, First, I'd like to explain something that my brother, uh, Les Paul Stewart from, uh, well, I met him in Louisiana, but now he currently resides in Greeley, Colorado, so shout out to Les Paul Stewart from uh, from, uh, Louisiana slash Colorado, Colorado, Colorado. And, um, he will, hopefully, Abba willing, will be starting his own podcast channel soon, and he's gonna call it STORM, uh, which is, uh, S-T-O-R-M, and it's gonna, it's basically stands for Select Troops of the Returning Messiah. I do believe that's what he plans on calling it. Um, and then hopefully down the road we are going to collaborate forces and make our joint podcast channel which will be called Finding Higher Ground in the Storm. Uh Uh-huh. Let me tell you, dear listeners, if you think that I'm interesting, wait until you hear what my brother, Les Paul, and I have to say. First of all, Bible studies like you've never heard in your life, guaranteed. We're talking about a 16-year and ongoing fellowship between a Messianic Gentile and a Messianic Israeli Jew who've never once had any argument about doctrine. Once. We are two very separate individuals that have had two very separate and distinct upbringings and yet here we are i talk to this person every day multiple times a day and 95 percent of my conversations with this man are about messiah yeshua and his kingdom and how we plan to advance it and have people listen to our words and listen to what we have to say and listen to how we live our lives and perhaps stir something within you that will that will make you ask questions and knock on the right doors so that you can can come into this amazing kingdom and see that it is all real. So if you think that my podcast is special, you just wait until my brother Les Paul and I collaborate forces and start talking to you about some kingdom of God. We are about to be about our father's business, let me tell you something. Les Paul and I often talk about this concept that we have that can help people understand the triunity better, and this concept is one cubed. 
We both have concluded after consulting Ruach HaKodesh and reading scripture that if there were to be a mathematical expression to the triunity, it would be one cubed. After all, when you take one and multiply it three times, you still get one, which would explain the oneness of the triunity. So I think it would be an accurate depiction, an accurate mathematical depiction to explain the Godhead. One to the power of three. It's entirely possible that you will be hearing me refer to this term one cubed, or one to the power of three, multiple times in future podcasts. Another issue that I would like to discuss regarding Ruach HaKodesh and the Godhead of Adonai Elohim is the model of the nuclear family, also sometimes referred to as the family unit. Nuclear family, also called elementary family, in sociology and anthropology, a group of people who are united by ties of partnership and parenthood and consisting a pair of adults and their socially recognized children. Typically, but not always, the adults in a nuclear family are married. Although such couples are most often a man and a woman, the definition of the nuclear family has expanded with the advent of same-sex marriage. Children in a nuclear family may be the couple's biological or adopted offspring. That was from Encyclopedia Britannica Online. And this is exactly what I would like to discuss, specifically that last part of that paragraph. You see, if I am to believe the Bible and follow my Messiah Yeshua, then I cannot condone homosexuality. That does not mean that I hate homosexuals. I don't hate anyone. If I'm allowed to hate anyone, it would be Satan. This is something that I have to make abundantly clear. Just because believers can't agree with something does not automatically mean that we hate people. We don't. It's quite the opposite. We love people. It's very easy to hate people. I work in retail. This is not my full-time job. My podcast is not my full-time job. I make very, very little money off of this podcast. This podcast is not intended to make any money. It's intended to reach out to people so they could understand Messiah Yeshua, this person that we call, that you guys call Jesus Christ, better. If you decide to call him Messiah Yeshua, I would love that. I don't think he would mind too much either. But this is not my full-time job. I work in retail and I meet all kinds of people at work. For all of you guys out there that listen to me that work in retail or have ever worked in retail, you would understand exactly what I'm talking about. We meet all kinds of people, and it's not easy to love people, and yet, that's the trick. Because if love was easy, it wouldn't be a commandment. Think about that for a second. Adonai Elohim said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He never ever said, only if they're like you. Only if they think like you do. Only if they love like you do. No, he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So I'm commanded to love everyone like Messiah Yeshua loves everyone. Messiah Yeshua loves everyone equally. He doesn't love our sin, but he loves us endlessly. He loves us so much that he willingly laid his life down for us and willingly picked it up again. Nobody murdered Yeshua the Messiah. He willingly laid his life down for his sheep. He willingly laid his life down for all the homosexual people of the world. Not just me or you, but all those people that we don't find worthy supposedly. Messiah Yeshua finds them worthy. He touches whoever he decides to touch. If he decides to touch a homosexual person, that's Adonai's business. The one thing that we cannot do is continue to live in sin and expect to be welcomed into the presence of Adonai Elohim. 
That goes for me too. You don't think that I wrestle with stuff? Oh, I wrestle with plenty of stuff. Sometimes I am ashamed. Absolutely ashamed. And yet, whenever I seek him out, he's right there every single time and he blows me away that he comes back to me every single time. How do I know that it's him? Oh, I know. Trust me. When I'm sitting on my bus on the way to my job and I listen to my worship music and the tears are streaming down my face because I don't feel worthy enough to be loved like that. Loved to the point of death and life again. And people are probably staring at me on the bus. Why is he crying? What's going on? Why is he so upset? I'm not upset. Tears of joy, or waterfalls of joy coming out of my eyes. The joy of Adonai is my strength. Somebody said that to me today at my job, and I'm sharing that with you today. That's from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10. And it's true, dear listener. It's all true, because when you realize that this man that is actually Adonai Elohim, the God of the impossible, that he, that he came down as a person and willingly laid his life down to take away your sins, if you believe in this, if you really do believe in all of this, then your sins are taken away and that you don't have to experience what I have referred to in the past as the second death. Your spirit will not die. Your body might pass away. Your body will pass away, but your spirit will not die. Your soul will not die. That's what Abba wants. That's what Adonai Elohim wants. So that you do not perish. Yohanan 3, 16, 17 For Adonai Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only and unique Son so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life instead of being utterly destroyed. For Adonai Elohim did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but rather so that through him the world might be saved. Those who trust in him are not judged. Those who do not trust have been judged already, in that they have not trusted in the one who is God's, Adonai Elohim's only and unique son. God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. God doesn't want you to perish. God wants you to live. He wants to give you life and in abundance. The church that I go to here in Washington State, and right, it's actually right down the road from me here in North Seattle, uh, it's called Epic Life. Because we want you to have an epic life in Messiah Yeshua. Epic Life Church, 105th and Stone in North Seattle. Come check us out. I'm not officially on paper affiliated with this congregation, but I am heavily involved. And I will tell you that Ruach HaKodesh is doing something amazing in this congregation. Because there's myself, and then there's Keith, who has the privilege of being a pastor at that congregation. And then there's we just had a brother who was a former Muslim and attended a Messianic Jewish congregation not too far away from where I live, here in North Seattle. And uh, so now all three of us are under one roof, and if that's not something that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, would do, I don't know what is. Muslim, a Christian, and a Messianic Jew all attending the same congregation. It almost sounds like the beginning of a joke. Yes, yes. I was talking about the nuclear family, and I went down a rabbit hole. And all of this connects, I promise, because we were talking about, you know, the nuclear family most of the time. Up until here recently, it was the heterosexual couple and a child. So now they're expanding the definition to include homosexual couples and a child they can adopt. So, as a believer, I have a problem with this, but I, but I don't hate homosexual people. Here's the dealio, Emilio. I'm gonna make this very clear. We all have sin. Adonai Elohim abhors all of our sin collectively. He hates 
it. He hates our sin. He hates when we play in our sin. Think of a little baby playing in its poo, okay? That is the analogy of us playing with our sin. And as a parent, it's instinctive to take our child and clean it from its poo and give it a new diaper. Remember my analogy from my daughter? It's been a long time since I've mentioned it, but I have I have a story about my daughter who now wants to be a boy. It's about her sitting in her diaper. I was playing World of Warcraft and I smell something. This is like when she's like two. I'm playing World of Warcraft like about 10 years ago and uh, I'm smelling something. And I get up and I check her and I'm like, are you are you poopy? Let me change you. And she puts up her hand to me and she says to me, no, Abba, don't smell me. And then I immediately froze because I heard Ruach HaKodesh say in my mind, this is how you are with me. So instinctively, our parents sees its child playing in its poo. We want to take the kid and wash it clean and change its diaper. And it's funny because the baby resists. The baby doesn't want to get clean. It likes sitting in its poo and smelling it and playing it comfortable. It's gross, right? Well, there you go. When Abba sees us, when Adonai Elohim sees us children playing in our poo, it, it grosses him out, rightly so, and he wants to change our diaper. But we foolishly resist. We don't know why. Why do we want to sit in our poo? Why, why do we like playing in our poop? Why do we do that? Pick up my poop, Brian. Pick up my poop. He has a thin napkin. So back to the whole sin thing. We all sin. We all sin. We all do it. We are all in this boat together. The Bible clearly states that we are all sinners. There is no one that is good. We, are, we all fall short of the glory of God. There is no one good. No one. Here, I'll actually read it to you so that you could... Hear it yourself because I, I don't like paraphrasing so it's actually in Romans 3 verse 23 out of the complete Jewish Bible since all have sinned and come short of earning God's praise and that means all God doesn't love me more because I'm straight and God doesn't hate you dear listener who if you are happen to be of the LGBT community God doesn't love you less because you're gay. I'm, I don't get special points because I'm straight and you get merits, demerits because you're a homosexual. It doesn't work like that. Messiah Yeshua came to die on that cross for every single person. Does not matter the type of sin. Homosexual, a person who cheated on his wife, a murderer, a guy who watches porn 14 hours in a day. Um, I can go on and on and on. There's all kinds of different transgressions. But he died for all of them. He is the great equalizer. He levels the playing field. Nobody is exempt from anything. With that being said, I cannot agree with this. And, and it is true that people can adopt but the Bible, if we are Christians, we are followers of Yeshua the Messiah, and according to the scriptures that we follow, same-sex marriages are not a thing. They can't call it a marriage because a marriage produces something. It produces a child. You can, adopting a child and giving birth to a child is not the same thing. It doesn't matter how you slice it. It doesn't matter how you define it in a dictionary. Giving birth and adopting is definitely not the process. Although I commend adoption, I'd rather people adopt than abort. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But giving birth and adopting are not the same thing. Exactly the reason why Ruach HaKodesh had to come and... What did Yeshua say in John 3, 6 to Nicodemus? You must be born from above you must be born again from heaven from the spirit me you the homosexual the murderer the rapist the this one the that one 
we all, all of us, have to be born again from above so that we cannot blame what we used to be. We can't blame everything on and anything on that anymore. That's done. When we become born again from above, we are now children of Adonai. And our old self doesn't matter. I personally and humbly feel and believe that the nuclear family is under attack by the adversary. The adversary wants to make the lines fuzzy and sow confusion and redefine things. Just like he redefined things for Eve in the garden right before she ate from the fruit. She redefined what God said to her so that he could tempt her to eat the fruit. And Eve was not the target. Adam was the target because Adam is the covering of Eve. So the adversary went through Eve to get to Adam. The world did not fall from grace until Adam ate from the fruit. Or I should say fall to grace from favor. I am aware that I digress a lot. I apologize. The nuclear family is under attack because the nuclear family is a reflection of the triunity. So the nuclear family is under attack because the triunity is under attack. See, the adversary wants to disrupt God's order. Adonai Elohim has an order to things and the adversary wants to disrupt this order. He will do everything he can to disrupt this order. One of the most efficient ways the adversary likes to disrupt Adonai's order is by redefining things that Adonai has already decreed. See, the adversary wants to skew your perception of reality. So what better way to do that than to target the nuclear family, which is the reflection of the triunity, even more so now that we've established that it's a distinct possibility that Ruach HaKodesh is feminine. So it makes perfect sense. You have Abba Father, Ruach HaKodesh, who is the mother, and Yeshua the Messiah, who is the son. There is your nuclear family. So if you ever hear from people that the nuclear family is indeed under attack, it's the truth. It is. Because the adversary is waging war against Adonai Elohim. Period. Things make a lot more biblical sense if we start looking at it with the idea, the concept that Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is actually the feminine aspect of God. Now, I'm going to talk about the Triunity even deeper in other podcasts, but now I'm going to take this moment and break off from this specific topic of conversation and start going into chapter 4 of Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus. Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus, Chapter 4 the creation mandate. We seek to read the Torah according to its literary genre. We would be wise to search for the key themes of the storyline in its opening chapters. Given the fact that opening chapters in biblical literature, the Tanakh and New Testament alike, frequently introduce the key themes and ideas of the books as a whole. As we shall see, Genesis 1 26 through 28 introduces the major themes that are developed in the remainder of the Torah. Then Elohim said, Let us make humankind in our image, in the likeness of ourselves, and let them rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the animals, and over all the earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the earth. So Elohim created humankind in his own image. In the image of Elohim he created him. Male and female he created them. Oh, how appropriate. Verse 28. Elohim blessed them. Elohim said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living creature that crawls on the earth. Now, I had just read that passage from my complete Jewish study Bible, but the version that is used in the book Reading Moses, Seeing Jesus is the English Standard Version. I think they picked that version because it's the most used version now within the Gentile Church. Not entirely sure. 
I thought it was New American Standard. I kind of prefer that it would be New American Standard. If I had my way, everybody would be reading out of the complete Jewish study Bible, but that's just me. Moving forward. The typical pattern of the creation week is as follows. And God said, plus, let there be, plus, and there was morning and there was evening, and X day. However, there are two instances in the creation account that break one or more of these features of predictable literary patterns of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 all the way through to Genesis 2 verse 3. First, the pattern is broken with the creation of humankind on the sixth day, as, instead of, let there be, God uses words of divine deliberation, let us make. Second, the seventh day lacks both divine speech and an end. These disruptions of the pattern are intentional, drawing our attention to themes that will play an important role as the Torah's story continues to unfold. The broken pattern from let there be to let us make on the sixth day draws the reader's attention to the theme of human rule over the land and everything in it, a prominent feature of what is called the creation mandate. Here we encounter our first footnote of chapter 4. Let's see what it says. Footnote number 1. Although Rashi argues that God is speaking with the angels, the fact remains that angels are nowhere referenced in the first chapter of Genesis. Hmm, interesting observation, this is true. God and the Spirit of God, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, are, however, present in Genesis 1. Properly speaking, God is not alone in the creation account. Support for the unity and plurality of God let us make in our image, is found when we notice verse 27. There we find a unity and plurality in man. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Man, singular, properly speaking, is represented by male and female, plural, a unity and plurality. Remarkably, the same feature is reflected grammatically in the reference to the plurality of the one true God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through 2. The verb used to describe Elohim in Genesis 1 1 is grammatically masculine. In the beginning, Elohim created masculine singular verb the heavens and the earth. The verb used to describe the Spirit of God in Genesis 1 2 is feminine, and the Spirit of God, Ruach HaElohim, was hovering, feminine singular verb, over the face of the waters. Oh, gee, I've heard this somewhere before. I just can't figure out. We, the authors of this book, are not arguing that God is ontologically both a male and a female. Rather, we are arguing that the unity in plurality of the one creator is described with both masculine and feminine verbs, and this unity and plurality is reflected in the creation of humankind in the image of Elohim. The definition of the word ontologically means of or relating to essence or the nature of being. For those who did not know what that word meant, like myself. I still maintain my position that Ruach HaKodesh is the feminine aspect of the Godhead. Of course, I don't have PhDs in Biblical studies like these guys do. I'm not a recognized expert in anything. I am just here for the entertainment. Alright, let us proceed. God's Threefold Promise the creation mandate includes the three themes of Genesis 1.28 that make up the promises contained in the Abrahamic Covenant. These three themes form the basis of God's dealings with and purposes for the people of Israel, namely blessing, seed, and dominion over the land. And God blessed, blessing, them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, seed, and fill the earth and subdue it, land. And here we have footnote number two, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 1.28 Let's take a look at footnote number two. Hmm, very interesting observation here. Footnote number two. True to the emphasis on the number seven in the creation account, the land is mentioned seven times in the creation mandate. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. Two aspects of the creation mandate are directly tied to the Abrahamic covenant, which are generally masked by the English translations. First, the man and woman are called to exercise dominion over the Eretz, a word that may be translated as earth or land, depending on the context. When Eretz is translated as earth, one easily misses the fact that the creation mandate includes one of the three major components of God's threefold promise to Abraham and to Israel, the gift of the Eretz, land. Second, the creation mandate specifically includes a command to Kavash, the Eretz. The typical translation, subdue the earth, blurs the rather obvious connection to another key component of the Abrahamic covenant, the conquest of the promised land, Kibush Haaretz. Later on in the Torah and the former prophets, this phrase is used explicitly to refer to Israel's conquest of the promised land. Numbers 32, 22, and 29, Joshua 18, 1. What is more, this same verb is used of King David's conquest of the nations in 2 Samuel 8, 11, followed on the heels of the making of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. In short, blessing, seed, and land are the central themes of the story from Genesis through 2 Kings. These themes also form the foundation for biblical eschatology. God's purpose in creation and in the election of Israel is to bless, multiply, and establish his rule over the land through the seed of the woman. Genesis 3.15 Adam, God's first king. Having considered the creation mandate as the primary plot of the story, let's see how these three themes converge in Adam and Eve. Their story anticipates Israel's story and points to God's creation purposes for humanity. Adam, understood as humankind, male and female, made in the image of God, is a king. The terminology used to describe rule and dominion in the creation mandate is used elsewhere to describe the rule of kings, language that, coincidentally, is also repeated in some well-known messianic prophecies. The Hebrew word Rada is the first of several dominion terms used in the creation mandate. Then Elohim said, let us make man, Adam, Adam, in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion, Rada, over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That was Genesis 1.26, most likely English Standard Version. This term is used to describe Solomon's rule over the land in 1 Kings chapter 5 verse 4, or 1 Kings 4 verse 24 in English versions. I do recall mentioning this in the past, but I will mention it again, that the Gentile canon and the Jewish canon are not the same. The orders of the books are different. Remarkably, Though not surprisingly, this verb also appears in three passages that are traditionally regarded as messianic. And one from Jacob shall exercise dominion, Rada, and destroy the survivors of cities, Numbers 24, 19. May he have dominion, Rada, from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth, Psalm 72, 8. Oh, there's a little asterisk there. See Zechariah 9.10b, another well-known messianic prophecy whose words are nearly identical with Psalm 72.8. Interesting. And the third messianic verse is, Adonai sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule, 
Rada, in the midst of your enemies. Psalm 110, verse 2. God intends to establish his rule over creation through Adam and his seed. Adam, God's first priest. To appreciate Adam's priestly role, we must first recognize the extent to which creation Eden imagery permeates the tabernacle. Scholars have long noted that many thematic and verbal parallels between the creation week and the tabernacle narrative, Exodus 25 to 31, 35 to 40, some of which are worth noting here. And then there's a third footnote. Footnote number three. See, for example, Shimon Bacon. Bacon? I don't think it says bacon. That doesn't sound kosher at all. Shimon Bacon. Creation Tabernacle and Sabbath. Jewish Bible Quarterly 25, number 2, April 1st, 1997. Michael A. Fishbane. So it's basically a whole list of different uh, books that you can look up and find this all out. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read all of this. Moving forward. One. As the creation week is divided into seven days, Genesis 1 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, 31, and then Genesis 2, 1. So the blueprints of their tabernacle are given in seven speeches. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. Exodus 30, verses 11, 17, 22, and 34. Exodus 31, verse 1, and verse 12. And in both cases, the seventh day and the seventh speech focus on the Sabbath. Hmm, what a coincidence. In the former, the Sabbath is the climax of creation. In the latter, the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant. 2. The creation and the construction of the tabernacle conclude with statements of completion. Genesis 2.2, 2, Exodus 40.33b. 3. Once creation and construction are completed, they are inspected. Genesis 1.31a, Exodus 39.43a. 4. The creation and tabernacle are blessed. Genesis 1.22, Genesis 1.28, Genesis 2 verse 3, Exodus 39 verse 43b. 5. The spirit, Ruach, is vital to the creation construction process. Genesis 1.2, Exodus 31. 3, Exodus 35, 31. 6. The creation narrative and the tabernacle narrative both include accounts of a fall. Genesis 3, Exodus 32. In addition to these literary parallels, both accounts include a high degree of terminology unique to these narratives. Footnote number 4. The word for lights in Genesis 1:14-16 is only used elsewhere in the Torah to describe the menorah. Exodus 25, verse 6, Exodus 27, verse 20, Exodus 35, verse 8, 14, 28, Exodus 39, 37, then Leviticus 24, verse 2, Numbers 4, 9, and 16. The process of separation so vital to creation, example, light from darkness, water from water, night and day, is also vital to the priestly legislation. Genesis 1 verse 4, 6 and 7, 14, 18. Exodus 26, 33. Leviticus 1, 17. Leviticus 5, 8. Leviticus 10, 10. Leviticus 11, 47. Leviticus 20, 24 through to 26. Numbers 8, 14. Numbers 69 and Numbers 21. The specific form of the verb for yield seed in Genesis 1.11 is used elsewhere only in Leviticus 12.2. The distinction of the animals according to their kind in Genesis 1.6-7 is elsewhere only used with respect to the classification of clean and unclean animals in the Torah. Genesis 1.11-12 Genesis 21, Genesis 24 through to 25, Genesis 6:20, Genesis 7:14.
Leviticus chapter 11, verses 14 through to 16, and then verses 19, 22, and 29. Deuteronomy 14, 13 through to 15, and 18. The Hebrew word for the word expanse is only used elsewhere in the Torah with respect to the tabernacle and its service. Genesis 1, 6 through 8, 14 through 15, 17, 20, Exodus 39, 3. Numbers 16.39 Finally, the focus on dietary provisions restrictions in Genesis 1.29-30 through 30 is essential to the Mosaic Law. See Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Then I have a small little chart here, and it says over the chart, parallels between creation and the tabernacle, and then on the left side of the chart I have creation, and on the right side it says tabernacle, there are two boxes that are set side by side. Underneath creation it says statement of completion, and on the seventh day God, Elohim, finished kala, his work, melacha, that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. Genesis 2.2 2. On the right side it says tabernacle, statement of completion. So Moses finished kala, the work, Melacha, Exodus 40, 33b. Chart proceeds to point out the similarities in the Hebrew words from the creation and the tabernacle. There are very similar uh, astounding parallels. Inspection. And God saw, Ve'yar, everything et kol that he had made, and behold, hine, it was very good. Genesis 1, 31a. So that was the creation inspection, and here is the tabernacle inspection. And Moses saw, Vayar, all the work, et kol, and behold, hine, they had done it as the Lord, Adonai, had commanded. So had they done it. Exodus 39, 43a. Then there's benediction from both the creation and the tabernacle. And God blessed them. Vayverech Otam, Genesis 1, 22, 28, C, Genesis 2, 3. And then the tabernacle one would be, Then Moses blessed them, Vayverech Otam, Exodus 39, 43, B. So we are seeing these two mirror each other. Last one is Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water, Genesis 1, 2. And then the tabernacle one, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship. Exodus 31, 3. Very, very interesting parallels. I did not know of this until just now. I am learning this with you. In addition to the many parallels between creation and the tabernacle, there are also numerous links between the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle. Footnote number 5. For the classic treatment of the links between the garden and the tabernacle, see Gordon J. Wenham, Sanctuary Symbolism in the Garden of Eden Story. I studied inscriptions before the flood. Edited by Richard Hess and David Toshio Tsumura, Sources for Biblical and Theological Study for Winona Lake, something something, numbers. The following list of parallels draws heavily upon Wenham's work. All right, that was footnote number five. Let's continue. Point number one, we are told that God walks, hitalich, in the midst of the garden. The form of this verb is also used to describe God's activity in the tabernacle. Genesis 3, 8, Leviticus 26, 12, Deuteronomy 23, 14. Point number two, God stations Kulvim, these are the angels, I think you guys call them cherubs, Kulvim in Hebrew, on the eastern entrance to the garden, clearly parallel to the decorative Kulvim whose presence on the veil guard the eastern entrance into the Holy of Holies. Genesis 3.24, Exodus 26.31, Numbers 3.38. Point number three, the tree-like menorah in the sanctuary is likely intended to be a replica of the tree of life in the midst of the garden. Genesis 2.9, Exodus 25, 32-36. Very interesting parallel. 
point number four. The precious metals that are mentioned in the Garden of Eden narrative are mentioned elsewhere in the Torah with reference to the precious metals used in the construction of the tabernacle. Genesis 2.12, Exodus 25.7, Exodus 28.9 through to 14, Exodus 28.20, and Numbers 11.6. And then there's the sixth footnote. Footnote number six. It is clear enough that the prophets, by describing the future temple in terms of a renewed Eden, also regard the Garden of Eden as the prototypical temple of creation, from which all other sanctuaries are patterned. Compare, for instance, the river flowing out of Eden with the river flowing forth from the eschatological temple. Genesis 2, 10 through to 14, Ezekiel 47. Once we recognize that Eden is portrayed as the prototypical creation sanctuary, Adam's role as the prototypical priest over all of creation comes to light. First, we are told that Adam is placed in the garden to work and to watch over it. This twofold commission over the garden is, in fact, the same twofold commission given to the Levites, namely to work and watch over the tabernacle. Genesis 2:15. Numbers 3, 7 through to 8. Footnote number 7. Footnote number 7. Andrew J. Schmutzer. I really hope that's not your last name. Spelt S-C-H-M-U-T-Z-E-R. Schmutzer or Schmutzer? I hope it's Schmutzer. The creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply, a crux of thematic repetition in Genesis 1 through 11. Anyway, in this book he writes, quote, Just as Eden is God's garden sanctuary, the prototypical temple, so the terms keeping and guarding are used for priests who serve God in the temple and guard it from all unclean things. Moving forward. Moreover, having sinned, God clothes Hilbish, Adam's nakedness, with a tunic, kutonet, a phrase that is used most frequently in the Torah to describe the clothing of the priests in the tabernacle. Genesis 3.21, Exodus 29.8, Exodus 28.39-40, which significantly is intended to cover their nakedness. Exodus 28.40-43. Adam is the prototypical high priest over all creation, and all subsequent divinely ordained high priesthoods trace their origins back to Adam in the garden. Aaron's annual task of passing beyond the images of the Kovim to the place where God walks with his people, Leviticus 16.2, serves as a reminder of Adam's once privileged position in Eden before the fall. See Genesis 3.8.24. The connection between Adam's original priesthood and the Aaronic high priesthood is most notably highlighted by the prophet Ezekiel who depicts the king of Tyre in the likeness of Adam in the garden before his fall, adorned with all the stones upon the high priestly garments. I'm going to read this from the Complete Jewish Study Bible. You were in Eden, the garden of God, covered with all kinds of precious stones, carnelians, topaz, diamonds, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphires, green feldspar, emeralds. Your pendants and jewels were made of gold prepared the day you were created. You were a Kiruv, protecting a large region. I placed you on God's holy mountain. You walked back and forth among stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until righteousness was found in you. Here we find footnote number eight, which will be the last footnote, I do believe. Yeah, the last significant footnote anyway of this chapter. So let's find out what that says. Footnote number 8. Though this passage has typically been understood as a reference to the fall of Satan, the depiction of this high priestly figure in Eden is more likely an allusion to Adam, given the fact that Genesis 2-3 portrays Adam and not the serpent as a priest. C.F. Kiel and Delich F. Ezekiel Daniel, Commentary on the Old Testament, Volume 9. Peabody, Massachusetts, Henriksen, 1996, page 410, write, Ezekiel here compares the situation of the Prince of Tyre, Tzol, Lebanon, 
with that of the first man in paradise. And then in verses 15 and 16, draws a comparison between his fall and the fall of Adam. Moving forward, Ezekiel's allusions to Eden, Eden are unmistakable. Significant for our purposes is the list of gemstones used to describe Adam's covering. These are the very stones that are used to adorn Israel's high priest. Exodus 28, 17, 20, see also Revelation 21, verses 19 to 20. That would be the Choshen. That is a reference to the Choshen, the breastplate of the high priest with all the 12 stones, each stone symbolizing a tribe. About here with you um, and sharing this with you, I'm actually astounded while I'm sharing this with you because I've had no prior knowledge to any of this. So this is astounding to me, just as much as it might sound astounding to you too. And as we can see, there is a clear design to the text. Embedded in the text, there is a design that points to Messiah Yeshua. What are we to make of the parallels between the creation narrative and the construction of the tabernacle, and between the Garden of Eden and the design of the tabernacle itself? In a recent publication, Michael Morales looks at the lexical and thematic parallels between Genesis 1-3 through and Israel's story in Exodus from the parted seas of creation of the Exodus to the tabernacle of his presence, Eden Tabernacle. Then we have footnote number 9 which just says Morales Tabernacle Prefigured, pages 51-120. to 120. Morales highlights the parallels between the creation narrative and the construction of the tabernacle. Genesis 1 1 all the way to Genesis 2 verse 3, Exodus 25 through to 31, and then 35 through to 40. And between the priestly ministry of Adam and Eden and the priestly ministry of Aaron in the tabernacle, chapter 2 verse 4 all the way to Genesis 3 verse 24 and then all of Exodus and Numbers. He argues convincingly that the land in Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Genesis 2-3 is depicted as the outer courtyard to a cosmic temple with the Garden of Eden serving at its Holy of Holies. Genesis 2 verses 4 and all the way through 9. The effect of this depiction is clear. God places Adam in the garden sanctuary as the high priest par excellence, the high priest in the garden and king over all creation. Adam's royal priestly depiction clearly anticipates God's call on Israel collectively to be a royal priesthood, Exodus 19.6, and God's calling on Aaron individually to be the one who serves the God who walks with his people beyond the Kulvim. Now we are ready to consider the royal priestly Adam as a prefiguration and sign of things to come, i.e. the deeds of the fathers are assigned to the sons, both in terms of collective Israel as well as an individual who will arise from Israel's midst. What happens when Adam is not able to live up to the creation mandate and what does that say about Israel's future? Does Adam's Israel's failure nullify God's purposes of blessing through his creation mandate? And that is how chapter 4, the creation mandate, ends. So we are left with a cliffhanger, my dear listener. This leads us directly into chapter 5, the Adam-Israel connection, which I will most likely talk about in episode 17 of Finding Higher Ground. I very much hope that you enjoyed this podcast. I do very much hope you're still awake and that you've managed to listen this far. I hope the things that you've heard today are starting to click and everything is lining up and making sense. And I hope that you have been extraordinarily enlightened by the content of what I shared with you today. As Messiah loves you, so do I, and I will leave you with the ironic blessing. Yivarchecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'yechunecha Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom v'shem Yeshua HaMashiach May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift his face upon you and give you his peace. 
in the name of Messiah Yeshua. Be of good cheer and rejoice. There is a way out of this craziness we call the world. And that way is called Yeshua the Messiah. Be blessed and you will be hearing from me soon. Shefa brachot venishtamea bekarov.